morning. Glad you braved the traffic and the parking and everything else to uh, be here this morning. Uh, for those of you who are not from Washington, uh, welcome to our traffic jams. I also want to welcome you to the, uh, this conference, uh, jointly sponsored by FPRI. Uh, I have the honor to be vice chairman. Uh, our president, Al Luxemburg, is here as well, and the Woodrow Wilson Center. Um, the topic is quite timely because until about, say, 18 months ago, there was a sense that the United States had pivoted to Asia, that uh, our commitment was not just a security commitment, but an economic commitment, a cultural commitment, a recognition that Asia was the uh, land of the future, as it were. And uh, in the last 18 months, We've discovered that both major candidates no longer support what's called TPP, that uh, our Chinese friends and colleagues ha are promoting an economic system of their own, which I excludes us, whether it's the re RECEP, the Regional Economic Partnership, uh, which excludes the United States, uh, the Asian Infrastructure and Investment Bank, which excludes the United States, and, of course, on the high seas, uh, there's an effort, it seems, to exclude us from there as well. Uh, FPRI was founded in 1955. So we've been looking at these sorts of politico-economic issues for quite some time. And we do so from a very different vantage point. Uh, it's based in Philadelphia, which means it's outside the Washington bubble. That's already a huge advantage. Uh, secondly, we have uh, an approach that started with our founder, Robert strauss hupe that says you cannot understand today, much less tomorrow, unless you understand yesterday. We have found, uh, to our great chagrin, particularly in Afghanistan and Iraq, that when you are not sensitive to culture and history, you get yourself into deep, deep trouble. FPRI, which, by the way, is rated the number one small think tank in the United States. We're very proud of that, and we've had that ranking for a number of years now. That doesn't mean you shouldn't give us money so that we'll be bigger than the little ones, but uh, that is where we are. Uh, we have focused on this historico-politico-economic perspective for a very long time, and we teach it. We teach teachers. We teach everybody from high school students to post-grad students. Some of our interns have done pretty well afterwards. John Lehman, for example, was Secretary of the Navy. Many others, Republican and Democratic, were not partisan at all. And we're delighted to be here. We're delighted to partner with the Wilson Center. We've done it before so many, many times, and we intend to do so again. It's a top-notch institution. Um, Blair will tell you more about it momentarily. But I want to thank you all for being here. I welcome you, and I really look forward to a terrific discussion because as somebody who is coming up here on the elevator said to me, we have a pretty good idea of where one candidate is. But as for the other candidate, I'll leave it at that. I'm Blair Rubel, and I'm Vice President for Programs here at the Wilson Center. And uh, I, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Wilson Center. I, I want to begin uh, by 
saying a few words about our co-hosts, uh, FPRI, and maybe say a few things. It wasn't that they were being shy. They did point out they're the number one small think tank. But I want to uh, just say, make a few comments. I first encountered them uh, a long time ago, before I was here, and I've been here a very long time, uh, when I was at the Social Science Research Council, and I w was what was then called a, a Soviet specialist. And I became involved in work that they were doing um, on Soviet affairs and U.S.-Soviet relations. And um, a very exciting project where I was invited to Philadelphia to talk about the uh, city of Leningrad. And um, it, it always felt like it was a different place. And part of it is it's Philadelphia. Part of it is it's a small institution. But part of it is something that we have shared, uh, the Wilson Center and FPRI, that I think is very important and we just heard about, uh, which is the fundamental notion that you can't understand today and tomorrow without understanding yesterday. The Wilson Center is the official presidential memorial to Woodrow Wilson. We were founded in 1968, so we're a little bit younger than FPRI, but we, um, uh, the idea was to bring together the world of ideas and world of public affairs. And our mentor, um, and really, the primary founding father was Daniel Patrick Moynihan. Uh, it's not accidental that we have Daniel Patrick Moynihan, whatever place I think they call it now, uh, outside. It's had a couple of different names. Uh, Moynihan's last office is right downstairs. And he was somebody who very firmly believed as well uh, that uh, context matters, historical context cultural context, uh, political context, and economic context, obviously. Uh, so I think that this sensibility that has informed our programming has been the basis of long-term cooperation. Uh, we've, we, I can remember projects back in the early 1990s that we worked on together. And I also seem to remember that some of them were associated with presidential election campaigns as well. Uh, but this moment feels a little bit different. Uh, it feels different because uh, obviously we have uh, a significant choice to make about visions of America and the place of our country in the world, uh, a wider choice than perhaps we've had in many recent uh, elections. And for the reasons we just heard, what you're talking about today uh, fits into uh, how we're going to view ourselves uh, moving forward. And the challenges to the uh, so-called pivot to Asia are really important for understanding challenges about the co conception, competing conceptions of what our country represents. So this is going to be an exciting day, an important day. It is a, uh, in addition to the cooperation with old friends, uh, it is a special moment because just yesterday we received the final printed version of a, um, a new uh, book edited by Shihoko Goto, my, my colleague here, uh, Committed U.S. Foreign Policy in Asia and uh, Completing the Rebalance, and they're available outside, so um, I, I hope that they will provide additional uh, intellectual. My, Jane Harmon, our CEO, talks about this being an intellectual candy store, but this is more than candy, so I hope I hope we'll provide some sustenance. Um, and uh, as I hope I've just done, I wanted to stress the importance, obviously, of U.S. and Asia to our country and also to the Wilson Center. Uh, one of the real pleasures working here are all the remarkable people who pass through. And um, uh, I am about to introduce the keynote speaker for this event. And I'm not going to say much. I've been told we don't need a formal introduction. You have uh, bios of the speakers uh, that have been made available to you. But Ambassador Stapleton Roy is really a very special person. And all of us at the Wilson Center know that because we have the pleasure of seeing him uh, virtually every day. Uh, he is a, he's been a profound presence here at the center, as he has been in American diplomacy. 
He is a distinguished scholar and founding director emeritus of our Kissinger Institute on China in the United States. He is a career ambassador and he has served uh, in ambassadorial assignments in Singapore, China, and Indonesia. Uh, and, and he's been here at the Wilson Center uh, I, since around 2008, I believe. So it's already, he's already part of the institution in a very profound way. So with that, I'm, I'm going to step aside and turn the, the floor over to Stape. Uh, and I know you're all in for a treat um, in hearing Stape and in all the presentations that are coming up uh, today. Shihoko, do you have anything you want to add? Stape, the floor is yours. Good morning. Blair, thank you for that introduction. And Dove, it's good to see you here today. I can't describe the pleasure it is to talk about foreign policy when one is no longer serving in the US government. <laughs> it means I don't have to serve up intellectual candy I can serve up sour grapes. Uh, you can make your own judgment as to whether I'm offering sweet grapes or sour grapes. Uh, sour grapes are considered complaints of a sort, and I'm not really complaining. But since you're going to have a day of discussion on what is a very important topic, which is the future of American foreign policy in Asia, I thought I'd at least in some areas be blunt enough to give you some material to chew over. So the topic is a good one, but the timing is bad because so much depends on the outcome of the U.S. election in November. Uh, we can't really think seriously about what our foreign policy is likely to be without knowing who's going to be the chief implementer. Both candidates will face the same sets of challenges and opportunities, regardless of which one emerges the victor. But in the case of the Democratic candidate, we have a relatively known quantity. Given her four years as Secretary of State, we can make reasonable assumptions about how she will staff her administration, who will end up in key positions in our foreign policy and national security apparatus, and probably make some reasonable assumptions about what um, her approach to foreign policy will be, given that we have a four-year track record to base it on. In the case of the Republican candidate, all bets are off. He has no background in foreign policy and national security affairs, other than a brief trip to Mexico a few weeks ago. <laughs> He has been quick to make pronouncements on foreign policy and national security issues, but he has yet to display mastery of any of the relevant subject matter. We have not yet had the debates between the two candidates. I think the first one takes place on Monday. And those debates may provide some clues as to how the candidates will approach uh, foreign policy issues. But if the Republican candidate is elected, it's far from clear how he will staff his administration, since so many of the most experienced former officials in the Republican Party have repudiated his candidacy. This is really an unprecedented situation. It's not unprecedented for us to elect a president who has no background in foreign policy and national security affairs. We've done that uh, numerous times before. But it's unprecedented to have a candidate whose own foreign policy establishment has largely repudiated the candidacy. And so that raises questions about foreign policy direction, and it raises questions about who the implementers of the policy will be. So given these considerations, now is not the best time to make predictions about the foreign policy of the new administration. But as I said, regardless of who wins, we're still going to be dealing with the same world and the same foreign leaders. 
So let's take a brief look at the world with special reference to East Asia. But we can't deal with East Asia in isolation from the rest of the world. And frankly, it's not a pretty picture. In the Western Hemisphere, the United States, to put it bluntly, is mired in political dysfunctionality. Our national finances are a mess since intelligent discussion of the balance between revenue and expenditure has been taken off the table by making taxation an unmentionable word except for denunciation of taxes. Congress works a three-day week and hasn't passed a budget in years. We are passing on the cost of our military adventures to future generations in order to avoid any political blowback from a population that is now, because of the absence of a draft, divorced from the costs of our military activities abroad. And we're mangling our defense budget through sequestration, the worst possible way to allocate uh, reductions because you can't make value judgments as to which areas are more important. And neither of our two candidates, frankly, is talking sensibly about these issues. Uh, none of them has come up with a credible budget proposal, for example, in terms of dealing with both our domestic and foreign uh, budgetary needs. So let's leave the United States aside. In South America, Brazil's economy is sputtering. Africa continues to underperform. The Middle East is in perpetual crisis. And Europe, once a contributor to global stability, is facing two intractable problems the NATO confrontation with Russia, and the threat that the European Union may come unraveled. Uh, I've heard some very knowledgeable, very senior, and very experienced Europeans who think that Britain's exit from the European Union is only the beginning of a process that may uh, cause the EU to unravel. Not a certainty, but certainly a possibility now. That leaves us East Asia, which despite its many problems, remains the principal global bright spot. Now why do I say that? Because in my judgment, in East Asia, despite the many problems which I'm going to be touching on, if they're managed properly, we can still have a continuation of the East Asian miracle. In other words, there is a potential good outcome in East Asia, but there are also some terrible and dangerous outcomes if the issues are mismanaged. But when I look at the Middle East and look at Europe right now, I don't see good outcomes. It's not clear to me how a policy approach is going to straighten out those regions right now, given the nature of the, con of the uh, difficulties that mark those regions. But East Asia has the potential to do well if the key relationships and friction points are managed properly. The region escapes the brunt of the 2008 global financial crisis because China's economy recovered rapidly and this helped to buoy up the region. The continued US robust security presence represents a necessary but not sufficient part of the rebalance strategy. And I'll get into this a bit later. It has served as a check on what I would call Chinese exuberance. Uh, and I'm going to touch on Chinese exuberance uh, very briefly later in my remarks. Economically, East Asia also is still outperforming the rest of the world. So there are some real possibilities in East Asia, and there are some very intractable problems. Missteps in East Asia could have very serious consequences. North Korea's nuclear weapons and long-range missile programs are moving in the direction of what could be a very dangerous crisis. The strategic rivalry between China and the United States has not yet been stabilized. The downward spiral in Sino-Japanese relations has been arrested, but the relationship is still 
strained. New uncertainties have emerged in cross-strait relations because of the unwillingness of the new president of Taiwan to endorse any variation of the One China Principle. And the South China Sea has become a cauldron of conflicting territorial claims and major power posturing. This is a less promising outlook than 15 years ago. When the region was on cooperation and the region was on the upswing in the early 2000s, and the ASEAN countries were taking the lead in creating new consultative mechanisms in East Asia that were unprecedented. We'd never before had this frequency of meetings at the summit level that took place because of this new East Asian architecture. It's very clear, therefore, given this balance of possibilities and dangers, that East Asia needs sustained and well-informed policy attention from whatever U.S. administration emerges from our November elections. But more than attention is required for a successful policy approach in East Asia. First and foremost, the United States needs to adjust its assumptions regarding the region. The new U.S. president who will take office in January of next year will face a global situation and a situation in East Asia that differs in important respects from the world that we faced eight years ago when President Obama took office. In my judgment, not all of these changes have in been integrated into our thinking. And there's an enormous danger in basing policies on assumptions that are outdated because they haven't been looked at and re-evaluated. Uh, do you all recall the Arab Spring? Well, that was the result of processes that were taking place in the Middle East but they only surfaced when you had the crisis in Tunisia, which then spread throughout the region. But there were changes taking place under the surface in the Middle East, and most people didn't spot those changes, and therefore the Arab Spring was surprising. Well, changes are taking place in East Asia. Countries are looking at the United States differently from they used to, and our own role in the region is changing because of the changing balance of forces in the region. And so it's really very important for us to rethink our assumptions about East Asia and make sure that we're not dealing with outdated approaches. Let me touch on some of the areas where I think we need to do some serious thinking. First, the 2008, this is a well-known factor, the 2008 global financial crisis hit the Western economies particularly hard, enabling China's GDP to pass that of Japan and to narrow the gap with the United States' GDP much faster than expected. And this soon manifest, manifested itself in more self-confident Chinese behavior. This preceded the presidency of Xi Jinping. But he, his own management style as president has enhanced that because China is now putting forward initiatives, whereas the Hu Jintao presidency was more cautious in putting forward Chinese initiatives as opposed to supporting um, ASEAN-based initiatives under the principle of ASEAN centrality, which has now been pushed aside by China. Second. The assumptions underlying the rebalancing strategy in East Asia, which is that we would reduce our security role in the Middle East and that threats in Europe would remain modest. These assumptions just didn't pan out. We're still bogged down in the Middle East. It takes a lot of money to maintain the activities that were engaged in there. And the NATO expansion strategy which in my judgment was carried out recklessly because it has produced exactly the result 
that very knowledgeable European specialists accurately predicted over 15 years ago that this is what would happen. There's no reason to be surprised by the fact that we've had this confrontation, and yet the policy was pushed forward in a way that produced the confrontation, which had been accurately predicted. So in my judgment, there's a catastrophic failure of the European policy pursued by the United States and the Europeans. This is not an error by the United States. And for those of us who have some background in Russian affairs, it's inexplicable that we have been so off base in understanding how Russia was bound to react if we push NATO up to the borders of Russia. So what we have is a Europe that is less secure. We are being forced to divert scarce security resources back to Europe. And there's a very dangerous game of what I would call high stakes bluffing on the Russian border. The wrong place to have a confrontation because the stakes are so different. For Russia, this is a vital interest. For us to try to pretend that the Baltic states are a vital interest to the United States is ideological. It does not reflect real thinking. And those issues have never been debated with the United States. We went through NATO expansion without explaining to the American people what the consequences would be if threats emerged. And now the threats are emerging, and we are in an awkward position. Many of the European countries have been reducing their defense budgets. As Donald Trump has pointed out, only a few of our allies in Europe are meeting the 2% level th that was set. And so this is a real issue, and it's relevant to East Asia because the rebalance strategy assumed a peaceful Europe, and instead Europe is going to be sucking off defense resources. This is a fundamental consideration because of these resource implications. The ability of our economy to support a global strategy depends on the willingness of our political system to extract the resources from our economy necessary to carry out our global role. And frankly, we're simply not doing that. I like to point out that we were badly unprepared going into World War II, not because the Depression had caused our economy to be unable to be better prepared, but because our political system would not let us be better prepared and in many ways, that's the circumstances now. We're barely funding our military role, and all of the non-military aspects of our global presence are underfunded. We couldn't go into the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank because we couldn't come up with the resources necessary to buy our way into it. This is not a healthy situation. We've been forced to divert over $4 billion to our NATO budget because of this confrontation. And we're underfunding our own infrastructure maintenance requirements by 50%, meaning that our roads and railroads, et cetera, are going to get worse rather than better in the years ahead. If the new administration doesn't address these considerations sensibly, we will risk losing credibility in our global role unexpectedly. And so therefore, it's a very important issue. Third, China's rapid military modernization program has eroded US air and sea dominance in the Western Pacific. The hard reality is that the PLA's military modernization over the last 20 years has caused the net change in capabilities to move in favor of China even though the aggregate capabilities of the US military are still far superior. So in other words, we're seeing a change in the balance, but it still favors the United States and probably will for a substantial period into the future. But this trend line of a weakening US dominance is likely to continue in the absence of a severe economic crisis, either in Asia or in the United States or in both places. And it's having an effect on regional perceptions. 
We like to think in terms of our robust military presence in the Western Pacific balancing China's rise. But let's reverse that. It's perhaps equally true to speak of China's growing military capabilities as now able to balance the US air and sea dominance that we have enjoyed in the region since the end of World War II. In other words, we're being balanced at the same time that we're balancing China. And this is a little difference because in the past the military balance overwhelmingly favored the United States in air and sea terms and this is less true now than in the past. Indicative of this trend, the brash and unpredictable new president of the Philippines, an important U.S. regional ally, recently claimed that China now has military superiority in the region. And he did this in announcing the end of joint U.S.-Philippine patrols in the South China Sea. He's also announced plans to seek military equipment from Russia and China. I think his assessment of the U.S. military position in East Asia is wrong, but it's disturbing for a U.S. ally to be talking in this fashion, and it suggests that the perception of the United States is going through a change. China and Russia, this is point four, have been pushed even closer together by Russia's confrontation with NATO over Ukraine. And the two former enemies are now carrying out joint military exercises in the East and South China Sea. It was, of course, the common perception of the United States and China of the Soviet threat that enabled us to break through in our relationship 45 years ago. And now Beijing and Moscow are finding a strategic basis for cooperation in their common concern about the potential U.S. threat. That's something we need to think seriously about. Is our foreign policy managing those relationships properly? Point five, U.S. efforts over the last 25 years to deter North Korea from developing nuclear weapons and delivery systems have failed. Pyongyang has carried out five nuclear tests and it's actively seeking to develop long-range ballistic missiles capable of targeting the continental United States. If Pyongyang succeeds in this quest, it will increase doubts in Japan and South Korea over the credibility of the U.S. nuclear shield over them, and this will have the effect of increasing proliferation pressures. I've heard some knowledgeable South Koreans claim that there will be 80% support for the South Korea going nuclear if the North Koreans develop a intercontinental ballistic strike capability against the United States, and that this would force South Korea in that direction. This may be a, an inaccurate judgment, but it represents the types of issues that are emerging because of North Korea's programs. And frankly, at the moment, the U.S. policy cupboard for dealing with these issues is bare. We've said that we'll talk to the North Koreans about anything, but we'll only negotiate on denuclearization. Well, essentially, nobody thinks that denuclearization at the moment has any credibility. So that means the best we can do is talk to the North Koreans, and that's not going to be effective in addressing the problems. Sanctions alone are not going to work, and there's no way that China could make them work, et cetera. South Korea, uh, North Korea has lived with sanctions since 1953, and they're tough as nails. The idea that you can somehow force them through sanctions to do something which they consider fundamental to their national interest is wishful thinking. So any new U.S. administration is going to have to think about that question very seriously because to show how we are out of tune with attitudes in East Asia, we have very senior former U.S. officials who are saying it will be unacceptable for North Korea to gain a nuclear strike capability against the United States. Well, what does that language say? It's acceptable for it to have a strike capability against Japan and South Korea, but it's unacceptable if Americans are put at risk? What kind of message does that convey to our South Korean and Japanese allies? We can't talk that way. If we think it's unacceptable, we still ha can't frame our policy in those terms 
because we should be equating our security interests for the American people with those of the Japanese and South Koreans who are part of our, our alliance system. Again, it's simply an illustration of how we have to be careful about how our perceptions are vocalized. With respect to Taiwan, we've had eight years of rapidly expanding trade and investment across the Taiwan Strait, but now there are growing uncertainties concerning the future of the cross-strait relationship. Beijing has suspended the functioning of the consultative mechanisms because of the refusal of President Tsai Ing-wen to endorse a One China principle. She, of course, campaigned on the platform of maintaining the status quo in the cross-strait relationship. So we haven't had an immediate destabilization of the cross-strait relationship, but the One China underpinning of it has now weakened substantially. And therefore, there are more uncertainties than there have been in the past. Now this, in terms of strategic thinking, is important. Because the harsh reality is that if we look in the decades ahead, Taiwan is simply not going to be able, it doesn't matter how robust American arms sales are to Taiwan, it cannot maintain a complete military balance across the Taiwan Strait because the mainland has defense requirements that are going to cause its military to become powerful enough so that Taiwan can expect to offset that. What that means is stability in the cross-strait relationship has to depend on sufficient military capabilities in Taiwan to make it costly to seek a military solution, but proper management of the cross-strait relationship is necessary to keep the threat low. If Taiwan doesn't get that balance right, it essentially loses control of its own security and becomes totally dependent on the United States as the offsetting factor to an effort to seek a military solution. And it's not in Taiwan's interest, I would dare to say, to lose control of its own security future. That means they have to be able to manage that cross-strait relationship sufficiently so the threat of a military solution is kept low. And at the moment, it's not clear whether or not we're going to have leadership in Taiwan that will be successful in addressing that question properly. Seven, we should not underestimate the negative impact on U.S. friends and allies in East Asia of the fact that both U.S. presidential candidates have repudiated the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It represents the vitally important economic aspect of the U.S. rebalancing strategy. And it's also significant that one of the candidates has implied a lessened commitment to Japan and South Korea by suggesting that they want, may want to go nuclear themselves. So in other words, there is a perception in East Asia that the United States is teetering on the edge of turning inward and becoming less committed to maintaining our robust presence in the Western Pacific. Now this perception didn't exist eight years ago at the beginning of the Obama administration. So a new administration had better think through its assumptions very carefully or it will be misreading what the Asians are concerned about. They're not looking for U.S. leadership. Why do I say that? Because East Asians don't want to choose between U.S. leadership and Chinese leadership. They want U the United States and China to have a relationship that permits them to get the benefits of the American presence but at the same time get the benefits of China's growing economy. What they want is confidence that the United States is determined to remain fully engaged in the Western Pacific. And that's the issue now that is in question because of some of the rhetoric surrounding our election process. Finally, I could go on endlessly, but eight, I'll just mention again the South China Sea because the disputes over land features in the South China Sea 
are roiling the waters there, and this has all sorts of potential implications over what should not be, quite frankly, a major issue of confrontation. So these represent some of the challenges that the new U.S. administration will face next January. I've sort of sounded negative in the way I've presented these things, but the other side of the coin is the United States has a very strong hand to play if we are prepared to play it. But that also involves a willingness to ask for sacrifices from the American people in order for us to play an international role that will adequately support U.S. interests. And that's where the question is. We have been trying to pretend that we didn't have to ask for sacrifices from the American people and continue to sort of give them a free ride while we continue to play a global role. And frankly, that's simply not realistic. And if our leaders talk in those terms, you can be sure that we're heading for a comeuppance. Our hand will be greatly weakened if East Asian countries gain the impression, as I mentioned, that we're turning inward and that our commitment to remaining fully engaged in East Asia is weakening. And this illustrates why so much rests on the outcome of our November election. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sabe. Um, I know we have about um, 18 minutes or so, and Sabe has kindly um, agreed to answer any questions that you may have. But one quick plus spot I do have is we do have microphones on both sides of the um, aisle. If you could please um, wait for a microphone to come to you and then identify yourself and keep your questions brief. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> See, this is the infrastructure maintenance that I have been referring <laughs> <referring> to. <laughs> In investment, not an expense, I would agree. Uh, Ambassador, you described in some detail issues with respect to North Korea's nuclear capabilities and, and missile capabilities um, and the constraints on using sanctions, et cetera. What affirmatively would you recommend the new administration do to try and address specifically this threat? Do I have a fully fleshed out policy approach? The answer is no. But what I would recommend is that any new administration needs to set up a policy group to come up with recommendations on how to deal with the problem. At the moment, we've created an irresolvable conflict in our policy approach. We've said we will refuse to accept North Korea as a nuclear power. but denuclearization has no credibility at the present time, and North Korea has continued to develop its nuclear um, options. This leads you to preemption. Can we take a military approach? The answer is to try for a military solution on the border of China without China's consent would be an act that could fundamentally alter the security picture in East Asia in unexpected ways. So in my judgment, playing around with the military option is the height of foolishness. So what do you do then? Do you keep yourself in a box? I think some variation of the approach that Obama has said is the right one. Namely, we don't have to formally accept North Korea as a nuclear power, but we have to deal with North Korea. We have to be willing to talk to them in whatever way might be helpful. And just to stimulate your thinking a bit, my judgment is we have to do two things. First, instead of backloading our approach to North Korea, 
set of incremental steps and eventually it leads to diplomatic relations or something. We ought to front load it. What we need is a halt in their nuclear and missile programs, but they're not going to denuclearize at this point. And we ought to go for diplomatic relations with North Korea. In other words, we ought to front load the problem in, in that fashion. But this ought to be looked at in a careful policy process. But if the policy process simply says we should do more of what we're doing but do it better, I guarantee policy failure. You can't have a sanctions regime without total Chinese support, and China is not prepared to destabilize the North Korean regime. And therefore, you're basing your policy on wishful thinking if you think that approach will do the trick. So we have to think out of the box. <coughs> yeah. uh, my name is Asmanul Karim. I am from I am Bangladeshi American. I am from uh, Maryland. You did not say anything about South Asia. Is a uh, one fifth population of the world lives in South Asia. You did not forecast anything about South Asia. I want to listen from you. Okay, I deliberately didn't talk about South Asia, uh, partly because the Kissinger Institute that I'm associated with deals with largely with East Asia and China from that perspective. The Asia program of the Wilson Center, of course, does include uh, South Asia. South Asia is important, but not in terms of the issues that I have been addressing. Why? Because the impact of South Asia on East Asia is enormous in philosophical terms, in religious terms, and in cultural terms. But in the thousands of years of history, South Asia has not been that directly relevant to the geopolitical factors in East Asia. The one possibility for somehow integrating the two regions occurred during the Mongol conquest, which could, if the Mongols had been nation builders, which they weren't, uh, you could have created an, an Asian balance of power. But in fact, the Mongols broke up into separate kingdoms, and the ones in the middle in Central Asia and South Asia and the ones in East Asia really pursued different courses. So is that going to change now? Yes and no. Because when you shift to East Asia, all of a sudden the focus becomes more on the India-Pakistan relationship, on Central Asia, on Middle East concerns, and to a degree the relationship with China and East Asia, but the geography is still so important. Now, geography matters. In Europe, for example, the Al Alps have been a factor, but they were crossable. And in history, they were crossed by Hannibal with elephants and things like that. The Himalayas have been a blocking factor. They're just too immense. So therefore, I find, it difficulty, uh, I find it difficult to bring South Asia and East Asia together in a coherent discussion of the problems. In a sense, they have to be considered as part of a larger framework. But if you try to integrate them together, how is India, for example, relevant to the North Korean nuclear problem? Uh, well, you could argue they could provide observers as they, you know, as in the past for some regime that was set up there, but in other respects, they're just not that much of a player. The Southeast Asians are not much of a player in terms of the Northeast Asian security uh, problems that are, that are emerging there. So I think South Asia now has some links in to the East Asian concerns through the East Asia Summit. But in most of the other areas, India is still a bit player, but perhaps an increasingly important one. But the importance has not yet risen to the level where India 
is a normal part of the discussion of the East Asian security problems. And to my concern, Russia is also neglected in this respect. So I think that we would have a healthier discussion if India and Russia were more integrated into our discussion of East Asian problems, but at the moment, the tendency is to not uh, give them adequate weight in the discussion. So that, that would be my quick comment. Sir. Uh, I'd, I'd go to this person first. Um, yes, uh, the last thing you touched on on South China Sea, I wonder if you could um, uh, maybe, I don't know what, what the word I want is, guess. So what is the end game, the Chinese? Do they, do they just want to shut off the uh, or collect tolls or something on the South China Sea? What, what do you envision as their end game with all this uh, building these, uh, I think one of our Navy guys called it uh, uh, island aircraft carriers? Well, uh, it, that's a good question. People keep forgetting, I say this judiciously, that unlike the East China Sea and the Senkaku Diaoyu Island problem, where there is no framework for dealing with the problem, in the South China Sea there is a framework. It's the Declaration on the Conduct of Parties in the South China Sea that was signed by all of the 10 Asian countries and by China in 2002. And if you recall, when President Xi Jinping was in Washington last fall, on the White House lawn, he said that China had no intention to militarize the Spratly Islands. But he also said, and nobody pays any attention to this, he called for more effective implementation of the Declaration on the Conduct of Parties in the South China Sea and speedy conclusion of the consultations on a code of conduct which was agreed to in the Declaration on the Conduct of Parties as something that should be negotiated and which would have more enforceability as opposed to the principles that were outlined in the Declaration on the Conduct of Parties. Now, if you read the Declaration on the Conduct of Parties, if the people who signed that declaration had all adhered to the principles that were outlined there, we wouldn't have the problems in the South China Sea today. But the fact that China continues to support the principles based on the statements by the president and that China has not yet fully militarized the Spratly Islands. It's put the infrastructure in place for militarization, but it hasn't put all of the equipment necessary in order to militarize it. And the fact that it's calls, calling for a speedier conclusion of the negotiations on the code of conduct, it seems to me there is a natural focus for the efforts of interested parties such as the United States to create a rules-based system for the South China Sea that can contain the problems or, in some cases, maybe actually resolve them. Now, why do I say resolve? Because China is the only country involved in the disputes that has actually agreed to negotiate the territorial disputes. In Chinese statements, they openly say that the territorial disputes should be resolved through consultations and <coughs> negotiations peacefully. Now, if you're prepared to negotiate a territorial dispute, there has to be some give and take. And in China's land-based borders negotiations, there has been territorial adjustments. So the implication of China's own statements is that some parts of the Spratleys are less important to China <coughs> than other parts of the Spratleys. And maybe there's some basis for a negotiation. But none of the other ASEAN claimants is prepared to negotiate. They say these are ours and we're not going to negotiate about them. Well, in this case, I think China's position is more reasonable. So in other words, the point I'm making is there is a framework for trying to approach the South China Sea which could stabilize the situation. And in my judgment, we've been overemphasizing <laughs> military posturing and underemphasizing support for a negotiating approach, 
which would help to stabilize the situation. But we have to be careful <coughs> because we're an outside party. And the negotiations on a code of conduct are between the ASEAN countries and China. The United States is not a party to those negotiations, and we shouldn't try to force our way in, but we ought to make clear where we stand on the issue. Okay? Here. Thank you, Ambassador. My name is Ji Ming Nguyen, with voice of Vietnamese Americans. I'm Vietnamese and I'm American. I beg to differ from your statement and many of your assumptions, which I think is very far from the fact. The first one I speak on behalf of Asian, and I would say that the Asian nations, especially the Southeast Asian nations, are yearning, longing for the American values. We all long for the leadership in the American values, including the 1.3 billion of Chinese in the mainland. We long for that values because it's been proven that after 70 years, millions, hundred millions of Chinese have been lifted out of poverty thanks to the values. And it's proven that for decades, Asia, Southeast Asia, and China especially, has prospered under our values. So the first and foremost is we asking for the leadership of the U.S. in defending and protecting our values. That's the first. The second assumption, I would say, is the rule of law comes from that value. And that has to do with the South China Seas, the East China Seas, the Indian Ocean, the Arctic, and the global seas. It has to do with the rise of old nations and old people, regardless of how weak or how, in how defensiveless we are, that we have the rights. Under the rule. Yes, the questions I have is exactly in conflict with all the assumptions you just said. And I would bring these questions of India, South Asia, and Central Asia into the picture too. I would say that India has direct impact in the global stabilization, especially in the sea, in the air, and in space. Mm -hmm. So I would suggest that we modify your assumptions. And then my question has to do with everything you just said about China. It seems like China has the manipulations of most everything in the world now. Thanks to the vision of Dr. Kissinger in the 1970s, would you say that the vision of Dr. Kissinger of that world order then was wishful thinking, and it's time for us to change that vision. Yesterday, I had the opportunity to listen to three think tanks, the CNAS, CSIS, and, all, and they said, the U.S. has to be resolute. We have to be resolute. Yes, so the question to you is, would you agree with all think tanks from the U.S. saying that the U.S. has to be resolute in s a certain the leadership of the U.S. in the world. Thank you. Thank you for your statement. Um, I have a question. No, uh, please sit. Please, uh, you're not the only person here. Uh, I think you have posed an issue which can usefully be debated uh, in the discussions today. Uh, I have represented the United States as a diplomat for nearly half a century. And I have found that the best way for the United States to gain support for its values is by living up to them, setting a good example. And frankly, we're not setting a good example or as good an example as we should be now. That includes on rule of law issues. I happen to agree with you that there should be leadership by the United States in pressing for the rule of law. We have not ratified 
the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. This undercuts our moral ability to call for rule of law approaches. On the democratic values, our political system is not setting a good example for democracies elsewhere. And polls are showing that support for democracy in many countries is going down because democracies are not functioning well. So in Thailand, we have an example of where the democracy produced such bad governance that we now have authoritarian rule reestablished after moving into a democratic approach. So in other words, how, do, how does the United States play a role in trying to set a good example in terms of its own values so that it can exercise leadership in this area? But where I would take a position on this question is for us to take a position of leadership by trying to impose or expand our values into other countries against the will of the people and the governance of those places is ineffective and amounts usually to domestic posturing on the question. And I consider the values that we stand for so important that posturing on them should not take place. I was ambassador in China where we were getting high attention to the human rights situation in China while the genocide in Rwanda was taking place and we paid no attention. That's outrageous. We have to be even-handed in the way we approach it. And the best way to be even-handed is to set a good example so that other countries can learn from our experience. What's important about the US example is not that we are perfect or not that we don't have problems, but the means we have to struggle to address our problems are not available to many of the people who live in authoritarian regimes. And that's the difficulty. We're seeing right now, daily in our newspapers, the struggle of our um, uh, black Americans who feel that our police system is unfairly treating them. And this has become a constant problem around the United States now. So is that bad? No. This is the way that free societies have to deal with their problems. You have to constantly struggle to improve and to bring your practices into line with your values. But to go out and preach to others that our values somehow are better than other people's values is not an effective way of spreading your values. Set a good example is what I would argue. Yes, yes back here. I'm sorry. Are we finished? <laughs> I'm running over time. I know we have a lot of questions, but um, time is precious, and I know you have yeah. many other commitments. So if we, you could all um, join me in thanking State for his <laughs> very insightful comments. And good comments. Thank you. Um, we will have a 15-minute break. Um, if you could come back by 1045 for our next discussion, which will look into the security issue. Ten minutes? Oh, I'm sorry, ten minutes um, at 1045. Thank you.